Well, it's that time of year to celebrate all things America, as well as my fourth installment of MIS, and today I have something special planned. This video isn't about a particularly popular or widely known movie, but it's still considered a bona fide American classic. I chose to talk about Mr. Smith Goes to Washington because it's a tough time for our great nation. No matter what side of the political spectrum you fall on, it seems like there's no winning. Whether it's liberals eating their own, not understanding how the Constitution works, assaulting anyone with a differing opinion, and peddling asinine conspiracy theories, or conservatives falling into the same double standard traps as their opponents, being forced to defend a president who doesn't exactly make it easy for us, and getting roped in with genuinely bad people we want nothing to do with. One thing is for certain, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington is just as, if not more relevant today as it was when it first came out nearly 80 years ago. After a senator croaks, the governor has to pick the replacement and is torn between what all his voters want and what Taylor, a powerful news tycoon, wants. Enter Jefferson Smith, the world's most American man. Someone the people like, but who is politically inexperienced and won't interfere with their scheme. Taylor, who is sort of like modern day CNN or New York Times or pick one, has been buying up a lot of land and is trying to turn a profit on it with the aid of Senator Payne, disguising it as a relief bill. So they don't want Smith to interfere with that, which gets harder because Smith isn't the kind of guy to just keel over. He wants to be taken seriously as a senator and he proposes his own bill. He wants to build a summer camp back home. Only problem? He proposes the same land be used that Payne's bill is opting to use. So it becomes a battle of wills between Payne and Smith. Smith ends up catching on to the true motives and the man who's really in control of his state and tries exposing it. And in true media fashion, gets railroaded. Taylor makes him look like a villain, a buffoon. Sort of like how mainstream media treated... Uh, I'm not gonna go there. I will say this though, the role of the media in this story is a bit of a role reversal from what it is today. Taylor wields the power of the press like a mighty sword, capable of anointing knights and slaying opposition, therefore having complete control over public opinion and, by extension, votes. Contrast that with today, where the media tends to fixate itself to a candidate and prop them up and try to tear down their opposition in an attempt to stay relevant because, if you haven't noticed, our current president doesn't give a rat's ass what CNN has to say. But I digress, the most important scene in this film comes right at the end. But because this isn't a contemporary film and only film buffs seem to have seen this film, I'm not going to get into a lot of detail until the very end. Frank Capra had a philosophy that many filmmakers and writers have. He believed in the happy ending, but also believed the main character should really work for it. Smith is a proactive protagonist and his wide-eyed idealism complements well with the character of Saunders, his jaded cynic of a secretary. And can I point this out? Everything in this movie, short of Smith's appointment to the Senate, is directly caused by Saunders being a freaking troll? Seriously, upon my most recent viewing, I was surprised at the level of agency the female supporting cast had over all their male counterparts. Good job, movie. It's Saunders who initially let the press loose on Smith, it's Saunders that helps him draft his bill, it's Saunders who knowingly pits Smith and Payne against each other so that she can go out in style. And it's her crisis of consciousness that convinces Smith not to give up after he's been burned in effigy. So he gives it one last try in the now infamous filibuster sequence. This sequence takes up the last third of the film and takes place over the course of 24 hours. And this time, Smith stays standing, pleading with all his heart that he is innocent and the whole Wilton Creek mess is Taylor's doing. You can say it was Taylor made. I'm not kidding, one of the characters actually makes that joke. Yeah, In true Hollywood fashion, Smith's passion and dedication to the truth is very convincing. No one who is guilty would make a mockery of himself just to prove his innocence. Throughout this sequence, Smith is painted as nothing but a good man who holds the ideals of the Constitution closer to his heart than any of the older senators. It's this precise brand of idealism that starts to wear on Senator Payne. Very much the same way that Captain America's idealism inspires others to act in Marvel. And just like how a little bit of ordinary kindness can go a long way to better your surroundings. That's why this is the most important scene. And this is as far as I can go without getting into serious spoilers. So, if you haven't seen Mr. Smith Goes to Washington yet, stop the video. That's it. You can seriously end it here. Still here? 
Right, I'm going to assume you're at least familiar with the ending. Here we go. Literally everyone is telling Smith to stop. He gets baskets full of letters from home telling him to throw in the towel, but he won't. And he delivers one of the most awesome speeches I've ever heard. I guess this is just another lost cause, Mr. Payne. All you people don't know about lost causes. Mr. Payne does. And he fought for them once because of just one plain simple rule. Love thy neighbor. And I loved you for it just as my father did. And you know that you fight for the lost causes harder than for any other. Yes, you even die for them. Like a man we both knew, Mr. Payne. And I'm gonna stay right here and fight for this lost cause. Even if this room gets filled with lies like these. Somebody will listen to me. Fun fact, James Stewart rubbed a special lotion on his throat to get it to swell so he could sound hoarse. Smith, now more determined to keep fighting than ever, promptly passes out. Then Payne, guilt ridden over everything he has done, promptly leaves the chamber and tries killing himself, which was actually set up in an earlier scene. Good job, movie! Suicide attempt fails, Payne storms back into the chamber and goes on a rant, blasting the tailor machine to bits, confirming that every word Smith has said is true. Smith won, he managed to break through to his childhood hero and he's not even conscious to celebrate. How freaking cool is that? I think that's one of the little details that elevates this scene above similar endings like fellow Frank Capra, James Stewart collaboration, It's a Wonderful Life. Smith did all this because he had a passion and love for America and faith in its constitution. He believed that so long as he fought, good would triumph. There's no pride in his victory, at least not selfish pride. There's no grandiose celebration, there's no delusions of grandeur, just a man face down in a pile of papers completely oblivious that he's made the world a little bit of a better place. That's why this is the most important scene. Thanks for watching.